going through a series of sermons on running the race. Running the race. And today we are back at it again to God's glory as we talk about an important subject that I've titled Running Your Race. God's way. Running your race. God's way. And we're going back to our book of the Bible that we have used before, which is Hebrews chapter 12. And that is where we will be blessed from again, Hebrews chapter 12. And the topic today is running your race, God's way. Father in heaven, we bless your name because of the opportunity that you have given us to be gathered again. Unto you, O God, shall the gathering of your people be. We ask that you will open our eyes, open our minds to behold wondrous things from your word. May we not miss your will, may we not miss your word. I ask that you will show yourself mighty on our behalf. I ask in the name of the Father that only you be seen, only you be heard, only you be known. In the name of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Running your race, God's way. Running your race, God's way. I want you to open along with me Hebrews chapter 12 as we examine from verse 1 to 17, running your race, God's way, running your race, God's way. In Hebrews chapter 1, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible reminds us that we are, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The chapter 12 begins with the word therefore which connects with Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the hall of faith, individuals that have run the race of faith. It is a call to join them in running uh, the race of faith, it is a race of faith. Hebrews 11, 39 says, All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith. So it's a race of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews eleven six. It is a faith race. It is a long distance uh, uh, and multi-terrain race. Uh, uh, God has assigned to each of us the measure of faith we need for our respective races. Romans 12, 3 tells us that, and faith is the fuel, the energy that should drive our lives as we run this race. The terrain for this race is not the streets of gold that's gonna have to wait till we get to heaven, but the terrain for the race for the believer is the mock and mare of this world. It is like running in sand or running in mud. And unfortunately, those who are watching us as we run are not predominantly fans of ours. As we run the race of faith, there are hecklers and scoffers and critics and booers and sometimes obstacles unknown. Hebrews 11 reminds us of what those who ran this race of faith before us faced. Lions they faced, sacrifices, war, torture, mockery, floggings, chain, imprisonment, affliction, and maltreatment. But despite all the difficulties, they endured and kept running the race. 
It was Jesse Owens, one of the all-time greats and pioneer in Olympic track and field, who won four gold medals. He said, the battles that count are the ones for gold medals. The struggles within yourself, the invisible, the inevitable battles inside all of us, that's where it's at, unquote. So we run the race, and sometimes it is the battles inside. Are you running the Lord's race? Or are you running a rat race? It's your choice. Whether you are running after the things of this world, the money and the positions and the comfort and a good life, possessions and all. Or you have put all your effort in serving Jesus Christ. It's up to you to decide what kind of race you're running. And by the way, this is not a race or competition against one another. You are not running against each other. No, no, no. You know, I, I read of two, two campers hiking in the forest when all of a sudden a huge bear jumped out from behind the bush and started chasing these two hikers. Both of them began to run for their dear life. But suddenly, one of these guys stopped pulled out running shoes from his backpack and quickly put them on. And then his, 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 his companion said, man, you're not going to outrun a bear. This is dangerous. Then he looked at him and said, I'm not trying to outrun the bear. I'm trying to outrun you. As if to say, well, the bear is going to eat one of us. It better be you. That's not the way to run the race of faith. It's not a competition, you all. It's not. You can win and I can win and we can be in it for one another. Let's run the race that God gives you. To run your race God's way, you have to be sure it is the race that God gave you that you are running. Not your coveted race, not your choice, but God's choice. You're, you are responsible to run the race God gave you. Understanding the will of God, Ephesians 5.17. Run your race, all Christians. No matter how different we are, we have our own different races, unique races. But it's not you who chooses your course. It is God who chooses. So I tell you today, that child of God, run on your lane. Stay on your own lane. You will be rewarded for the race God gave you to run. You will not be rewarded for running someone else's race. Are you with me today? A world class woman runner was invited to compete in a road race in Connecticut, United States. So on the morning of the race, she drove from New York City and followed the direction she had received to arrive at the place of the race. Well, she got lost and asked at a gas station very close to where she believed she was going. And then they led her to a place, a parking lot, where they were about to start a race. And she went to the people organizing the race and they recognized her as an, a world-class runner, but they saw that she had not registered for that race. Well, they quickly registered her and they were glad to have such a, a world-class runner in their own range. She ran, she came first, way ahead of the man who came second. Then when it was time to receive the reward, she noticed that the envelope didn't have a sizable prize or performance um, gift. Then she asked, well, why are you giving me this much? I said, oh, 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 we are sorry. You have won this race, but the race you are telling me that you are supposed to run is some miles on the other side of the road in another town. Ah, she had gone to the wrong starting line Run the wrong, run the wrong race, 
and miss a chance to win a valuable prize. I am telling you, you got to look to Jesus if you will not miss your race. And it is not a straight road oftentimes when we run the race of life in faith. Sometimes it is serpentine. Sometimes it's up the hill and down the crevices and valley. But how do I know I am running my race, not another? It is by looking unto Jesus. You got to keep your eye on Jesus. Oh, that text tells us in Hebrews 12 verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The Greek word there is not one that you find in different places in the New Testament, but just here. It means focus attention, which shuts out all other distracting object. Looking unto Jesus means you are looking unto him trustfully, submissively, and hopefully and expectantly and he will tell you when it's time to make a detour he will tell you whatever way the race grows and then verse one says laying aside every weight i'm here to tell you if you are going to run your race god's way you gotta travel light did you get that you gotta travel how light you got to run with the lightest possible load. Lay aside every way, not necessarily sins. Yeah, you lay aside the sins, but apart from the sins, weights, disturbances, encumbrances, burdens, overcommitments. You got to forfeit your right sometimes to run the race light. Your weight may be too much sports or too much shopping too much eating too many video games facebook time or social media time they may be weights that slow you down in the rays you may be walking too long or watching too hard to the detriment of your family that's a weight weights of distraction weights that slow you down weights that hold you back weights that impede your progress they may be pursuits like ambition decorating, socializing. It may be surfing the web or movies or music or talking too much on the phone or reading too many unimportant books. Weights may be unfriendly relationship or burdensome shoes that of entertainment that you carry. I'm telling you, you got to shed those weights and travel light. Your weight may be compromises or infatuations or obsessions or prejudices shed the weight the weight of your past the weight of your past hearts shed those extra weights and live simple walk simple your weight may be worry or anxiety fear shed that weight you may be a tail bearer that's a weight you are the one that wants to share the latest news be careful he says, lay aside your way. He didn't say, lay by it, which means keep storing up your way. He says, lay it aside. He didn't say, lay it down, as if to say, don't make an attempt to get rid of it. He didn't say, lay about. He says, lay aside. That means don't get lazy with it. He didn't say, lay in it, which means you are lying to creep into your life and cause weariness. He did not say, lay into it. As if to say, you criticizing everything. He did not say, lay it out. As if to say, you arrange your problem one after another. He did not say, lay it off. As if to say, you pile up your problem. He did not say, lay it off. As if to say, you pretend as if there is not a problem. He says, lay it aside. Exclude it. Get rid of it. Reject it. Travel light. If you're going to run your race, God's way, do you say amen in the house? It was in 1927. Charles Lindbergh became the first pilot to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Many people have tried and failed. In fact, six men that tried it 
died in the process. The problem was always there was too much weight in the plane. So to reduce weight, what Charles Lindbergh did on May 20, 1927, was he did not have a radio in that plane. No need for weight. No gas gauge, no night flying lights, no navigation equipment, no parachute. In fact, the seat he sat on as the pilot was a very lightweight seat. No co-pilot alone, no navigator. And he took off in this monoplane on May 20, 1927. And he, landed for, he started from New York and landed beside Paris, France. Having covered 3,600 miles, oh, in 33.5 hours, he landed with 100,000 people to welcome him in France. He became an instant celebrity. How did Charles do it? He traveled light. I'm here to tell you, if you're going to run your race, God's way, travel light. Turn to your neighbor and say, travel light. Turn to someone beside you and say, travel light. You got to travel light. If you don't travel light, you're going to get bogged down. <laughs> if you don't travel light, you're going to get stuck. Light must be governed by one rule. And that is to keep your eyes on Jesus. And stay in his word. Stay in prayer. And walk faithfully. For the master, that should be your goal. Distractions, distractions. That is why the race is not for the sweet. It's not for the strong. It's the mercy of God. There are many who should have made it. That distractions weigh them down. <laughs> I heard about a race on a cold January morning in, in the little town in Wisconsin. You know, this was an annual dog slayed derby on ice so they had their dogs and they had their sleigh and then they'll run about one mile and there were several you know young adults in this race and they had their several dogs and and they'll have their sleigh and and they'll run this one mile down the slope and there was a a, a young boy a little fellow barely five year old he had a little sled and he had a little dog. And everybody looked at him and said, you're not even in competition. Anyway, they started going down. And everybody passed him like he was not in the race. About halfway, one of the competitors was about to overtake another competitor. Halfway in the race. And the dogs, their dogs, began to fight. And then the whole place scattered. Dogs fighting dogs and, and sleigh tumbling and, and the riders tumbling. By this time, the five-year-old boy and his little dog and his little sleigh were coming down gradually. All they had to do was avoid the commotion because they had those other people that were the big shot expected to win were already bogged down in fight. The little boy went to the finish line. Only him finished. Of God, he got the first prize. Others were stuck in the way. In the church of God, those who have thought knew better are stuck with he said, she said, they said. Some have even gone to court. Some have even stopped talking to one another. Some have changed short or started another brand. All because they are bogged down with weights of hearts. And then the devil goes scot free. I plead with you, run your race God's way. I said, run your race God's way. You gotta run with intentionality. You gotta pay close attention to what the word of God says. You cannot fiddle around with wrong beliefs and wrong teaching. You can't keep chasing all kind of rumors around and spreading it in this day and age of social media. No, and by the way, don't settle. I don't care how long you have been in this race. If you compare yourself with yesterday, today, and you find out that you're not making 
progress, you should ask yourself if you're still in the race. Because for the child of God, you only get better and brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Don't settle. I said, don't settle. You didn't hear me. I said, don't settle. Don't settle. You got to keep moving on. Oh, the round gets higher and higher for the child of God. Don't settle. There was a man named uh, Nasseri who was uh, a native of the country of Iran. You know, he ran into some problem that he was expelled from his country. And um, he had his passport, so he took a flight to Paris. But when, by the time he got there, his passport was lost and he could not find it. With no passport, nobody will grant him entrance inside France. So he stayed at the airport. And after a while, they shuttled him to England. But with no passport, England would not let him in into England. They sent him back to France. And then he could not go past the airport in France for 11 years. Nasseri lived inside the airport. 11 years. He survived on handouts from employees and used the public restroom to keep clean. But he spent his time writing in his diary. In September 1999, the French authorities presented him with a travel card and French residency permit. Suddenly, he was now free to go anywhere he wanted. But when the airport officials gave Nasseri his papers, he only filed it in a folder and continued writing in his diary. You see, over the years, he became comfortable where he was. Over the years, he became afraid to leave the safety and comfort of the airport for something much better. And I'm saying today, there is a tendency in some of us or all of us to become accustomed to where we are, what we're doing, what we're doing right now. We're enjoying it. We are afraid to change. When God, who is leading us, wants to cause a change of job, cause a change of direction, cause a change in your ministry, cause a realignment, into higher ground. You are stuck. You are stuck. You just settled. Because you don't want to move ahead to a place you don't know. When you want to run your race God's way, keep your eyes on Jesus and don't settle. Keep moving on. Keep moving on. There are many people that we hail and praise because of the great work that they are doing amongst us but when heaven looks at him or looks at her looks at them heaven weeps but we hail them why because god knows what he has loaded that man or that woman with that person who gives an offering of a thousand us dollars and we say oh wow thank god God knows he could have given 10,000. That person who walks and labors and a hundred souls are baptized in one week. And we say, oh, wow, praise the Lord. And heaven says, it could have been a thousand in a day. The problem is this. God sees beyond what we see. He knows how many of us are operating below our potential. That is why it is important for every runner in this race of life to discipline themselves, to keep themselves under control. You gotta do that to make it. Oh, I love the way Paul puts that in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. 1 Corinthians nine 24 to 27 and uh, let me just read verse 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 verse, verse 24 he says do you not know the whole run in a race uh, but one received the prize run in a way you may obtain verse 27 but i discipline my body i bring it into subjection lest after i've preached others i may be disqualified what are you saying paul what are you saying what he's saying is that if you if a runner does not 
keep discipline and exercise, he will not achieve his best. So I'm here to tell you, keep training. Keep training so you can achieve more. Let the Lord increase your capacity to do more through his Holy Ghost. One man by name um, who had won for himself a place in the Guinness Book of World Records with the longest home run ever measured at 643 feet. His name is Mickey Mantle of New York Yankees. This man's prowess on the uh, on the baseball field was legendary. It was like he was born for baseball, meaning he, he was picked up for, for uh, most valuable player three times. In 1956, he won uh, the triple crown in baseball, and he had all those records. But you see, despite these wonderful records of his, Experts believe that Mickey Mantle never reached his potential. What most people did not know, this was way back in 1950s, was that Mickey Mantle was a raging alcoholic. Man, off the field, all he did was drink. But he got on the field and he performed. And they said, if only he had disciplined himself better, he will have achieved more. So, in the things of God, maybe you'll have achieved more. If only you submit yourself to God's discipline. Oh, look at Michael Jordan. He said, I play to win. That's what I do. <laughs> so, he, he led his team to six NBA championship. You know, and, and he was MVP in the finals each time. He, he, had, he has broken so many records in basketball. But the question is, how did you do that, Michael Jordan? Well, he shot 300 baskets per day. Now, to get 300 baskets, you know how many shots you will have thrown? Exercising discipline and endurance on a daily basis. So I'm here to say, we may never know your true potential because you have not really submitted yourself to the training and discipline and the exercise spiritual exercise so you may reach your potential so i am here to say if you will run your race god's way accept the discipline of god discipline your mind train your mind to think the things of god study to show yourself approved unto god the workman that needs not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of god discipline your body Discipline your moral character. Discipline your appetite. Discipline your speech. Discipline your priorities. I love the way Paul puts it in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 12. You know, verse 1, it says, run your race with endurance. Verse 12 says, Strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. If you're going to run your race, God's way, you have to run tough. Did you get that? You have to run tough. All the telltale signs of flagging energy, of flopping hands and wobbling knees that will reduce your ability to move forward. God says, strengthen your feeble hands. Are you tired because of the pandemic in this area? Strengthen the weak and feeble hands. Be strong and don't fear. Job said it well in Job 4, 3 and 4. Strengthen your feeble hands. Strengthen it. It you see, the word he uses in Hebrews 12, 12, strengthen, is the same word from which we derive the English word orthopedic, which means to make upright, to make straight, to straighten up, to suck it up, to get your hands and feet up. It means endure hardness and harshness and hardship, spiritual discipline, 
muscular Christianity is a must. Wrong tough, there will be huddles. Wrong tough, there will be hindrances. Wrong tough, there will be huts. Wrong tough. And God will give you grace. He will give you help. He will give you strength. Steve Jobs said, sometimes life is going to hit you in the head with a brick. But don't lose faith. Oh, Steve Jobs, you were right. And William Carey knew it. Raised in England and became a missionary in India. He knew you had to run tough. Because there he met lots of difficulties, including loss of partners, loss of wives. When he translated the Bible into some Indian language, all the books were in a wooden house. And fire broke out and destroyed everything. He had to start all over again. He said, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Run tough. Hudson Taylor knew that too. Born in England. Became the founder of the Chinese Inland mi Mission. He too was a man of faith. A man of faith. He asked that God would do his work through him. Oh, don't you give up. Run tough, run tough, run tough. Even when you're wounded in the race, keep running because God will see you through. Verse 13, Hebrews 12, 13. And make straight paths for your feet so that the lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. What are you saying here? Paul is saying, if you're going to run your race God's way, you not only run tough, but we got to run tough together. He's saying run tough together. We got to lock our hands into one another and help one another up rather than push one another down. Hallelujah. Oh, the church needs to hear this. The church needs to hear this. He says make level paths. For your feet so the lame may not be disabled but healed as you run your race help someone else run let someone else this is encouraging corporate toughness i know i know i know your department in the church is doing pretty well and you are glad to look over the head of the other person whose department is not going strong i got news for you you gotta join your strength to help that person be strong. Are you hearing the word of God here? There is a duty of mutual help. We are in this together. It is not a time for competition. It is not a time to show that you can do better. Let us make effort together. To help one another together. And Paul has a lot of encouragement. Of one another. One another. Hebrews 3.13 encourage one another daily as long as it's called today hebrews 4 1 it says let's be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it so we have to do it together hebrews 4 11 make effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following your example of disobedience so here there is a call of one another in hebrews 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 chapter 10, verse 12, uh, verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us encourage one another. We need to be the support system of one another. Galatians 6 2. Carry each other's burden in a way to fulfill the law. That's it. That's it. Ecclesiastics 4, 9, 10, verse 12. Two are better than one. Two are better than one. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Is a call here to cover a multitude of sins through love. It's a call here for each one, whatever they are gift, to serve one another. First Peter 4, 8 to 10. There is a call here to encourage one another. Build up one another. First Thessalonians 5, 11. I'm calling on you, gentlemen and ladies. Let's run tough together. 
lecture words, build another, not break them down. I plead with you, let your way be a guiding light for someone else. Don't bring them down. How are you hearing the word of God here? Another Olympic story of Olympians helping one another. It was a, a track and field and, and 5,000 meter race. And one was from the New Zealand, Nikki, the other from USA, Abby, and, and they started running. And then they hit one another as they were running somehow with 2,000 meters to go. And they fell. Hamblin, uh, Nikki Hamblin, fell on the right shoulder. And, and, and Abby also fell lying. And then they helped each other up and then held each other to the finish line. That's what I'm talking about. That's what God is inviting you to do. Don't you run alone. Help another make it through. Don't you stop by yourself. You know, in the Seattle Special Olympics, there were nine contestants, all physically or mentally uh, disabled, assembled at the starting line for 100 yard dash. Then they started running. They started running, you know, but, but there was one little boy who stumbled at the beginning of the race. Do you know what happened? The other eight had the little boy. They all slowed down, looked back, turned around and went back. Every one of them, they bent down, kissed the kid who had fallen, who had, you know, Down syndrome and, and they said, this will make you feel better. And all nine of them linked their arms and walked to the finish line. Everyone in the stadium stood up cheering for them. Let's run tough together. Oh, we are invited in verse 14. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see God. If you're going to run this race God's way, pursue peace. Be a person of peace. Ask for peace, encourage peace, and live a holy life. That's the way to run God's way. Because if you don't, God will surprise you by saying, I never knew you. Oh, may that not be your portion of mine. If you're going to run your race, God's way, listen to verse 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. If you run your race, God's way, it's true gracelessness. There must be no shortage of grace that you offer to another. Somebody who falls, don't laugh at him. Don't put it on social media. Extend grace. Great grace. We have all received grace. Let's approach the throne of grace with confidence. We'll find mercy. We'll find grace to help in our time of need. Let us be people of grace. We all need grace every day. Sudden need, sudden grace. Overwhelming need, overwhelming grace. Daily need, daily grace. As sin increases, grace must increase. Let's show grace to one another. Tis grace that brought me saved thus far. And grace will lead me home. I said grace will lead me home. Let's show grace one to another. For only grace, only grace, only grace will lead us home. Let's avoid all apostasy and bitterness. Oh, the, the other part of verse 15 says, Don't let the root of bitterness spring up, cause you trouble. Many have been defiled. Oh, if you're going to run your race God's way, avoid bitterness. Bitterness. She hurt me, I'll never forget. Don't allow the root of bitterness to be planted in God's church. I beg you, there's no room for witch hunting. There's no room for unforgiveness. Then, if you run God, your race God's way, watch your appetite. Tame your appetite. Verse 16 and 17. Don't be a fornicator like Esau. Muscle of food sold his back right. Afterwards, he wanted it, but he was rejected. He could not find it. Sexual appetite 
killed Esau in the race of life. Physical appetite killed Esau in the race of life. Watch it. Watch it. Where he talks there, the Bible says, don't be a fornicator. The word there is pronos, from where we get pornography. That's sneaking into the church, sneaking into the lives of church folks. Let's watch, watch your libido. Watch your libido. It might sink. Yeah. You may be able to sing like angels, preach like Paul. But if you don't watch your libido, you will fall like Samson. May the Lord give us grace. As we run to the finish line, Esau's experience was that of a focus on fawn, food, and females. Fawn, food, and females. Watch it. Watch it. Esau was outbound. His thoughts were on what he could touch, taste, and suck. Instant gratification was the rule of his life. He was described as godless. Oh, today I plead. God is calling you and I. Run the race. God's way. You know, this issue of race and Olympics and, and running was a Greek thing. But one of the most important of the races was the one where they had an Olympic torch and about 12 or 10 men were assembled before the city fathers carrying a torch. And this would be lighted. I mean, you're talking of a lamp, a local one, that the flames are visible and the wind can blow it. Their job was this, to go in the city streets with obstacles and barriers being placed in front of them. Their job for that race with the Olympic torch was to cross the finish line with their torch still lit. They had to watch the wind and watch the obstacles. This race was not for the fastest. This race was not for the strongest. It was a race of timing and rhythm, ability to shield from objects and the wind. If you run too fast, the flame will be put out. If you run too slow, the tar, like a candle, can burn out. The winner of the race was the one who crossed the finish line with his torch still lit. So winning was not speed, but endurance. Brethren, I call upon you. Has your light gone out? Has your light gone out? Let the Lord power you so you will not miss it. This little light of mine, I'll let it burn forever. You have the story of the 92 Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. Derek Redman from Britain, I mean, was set to win the 400 meter race. But as the race continued, somehow he turned a ligament or muzzle in his right leg and fell down. The medics ran to him, but he will not get on a stretcher. He struggled to his feet and was hopping towards the finish line. At that point, somebody came down from the, from the crowd. It was Jim Redmond, Derek's father. And the father held on to his son. Even though Derek was in pain, he was weeping, but his father held on to him. He did not become the first, but he finished the race because his father came to his rescue. Today, you might have been wounded in the race, but Jesus, your father, he wants to hold you to the finish line. As you run your race, God's way. If that's your desire for Jesus to help you to the finish line, why don't you bow your heads with me? Bow your heads. Jesus, I want you to help me to run my race to the finish line. Don't let my light go out. May I run my race. God's way. This is my prayer. In the name of the Father, 
and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.